Welcome to Preston Wood, and uh, on this Memorial Day weekend here in America, I know we have many people who watch all over the world uh, to our Preston Wood service, including those who watch uh, PowerPoint, our radio and television ministry. Uh, but to all of us here in America, this is a time in which we are remembering those who have fallen in battle, who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Memorial Day is a time never to forget and always to remember those who have paid the price for our freedom. Uh, we love our country, and as Christians and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as believers, we also are grateful for the privilege of being citizens of the United States of America. And I want to challenge you, and that includes many of you young people and boys and girls that are watching this service right now, I want to challenge you to, to love God and to love your country. And we ought to participate in the process of our country. And of course, right now, our country, along with many countries around the world, we are engaged in a battle. Uh, it is a battle against a micro germ, a germ, the COVID-19. And we have been sheltered in place for about oh, 70 days now. And we've been fighting this battle. And many people are, of course, afraid, fearful, uncertain about what's next. I'm hearing questions like, when will this ever be over? Will it ever be over? Uh, when it's over, will, will things be the same? Will I, will I get my life back or will I get my job back? And there's so much fear. It's, it's a kind of giant in the land right now. So our message today in the Fearless see, uh, series is about David and a giant that went down in the power and in the name of God. What an appropriate text on this Memorial Day weekend to speak of this battle that took place in the Valley of Elah in Israel many years ago. I've been to this valley with groups a number of times. You can stand in the very place where David, the, the shepherd boy, fought the giant and took him down. Uh, and you can imagine it. I remember as a little boy, I just reveled in the stories of the Bible, the heroes and the heroines of Scripture. And especially would, uh, would I look back always, I would have my grandfather, who often read the Scriptures to me and told me the stories of the Bible. I would say, let's go back to David and Goliath because I, I still just revel in, in this great champion. David is one of the legendary figures in all of the Bible. In fact, it is said of David, God says of David, he is a man after my own heart. And the scripture says that David served God, the purposes of God in his own generation and then he fell asleep. He was a man driven with passion for God and a purpose to fulfill God's plan for his life. And at the very outset, the beginning of uh, his life as a boy, really a shepherd boy, probably about 17 years of age. He's described here by the giant, Goliath himself, as, as handsome and young and ruddy. That is, he had a fair complexion, and many believe uh, David was uh, red-headed. So he was uh, such a great, great man. You talk about the most interesting man in the world, David was the most interesting man in the world. He was, a, he was a shepherd. He became a sovereign, had been anointed king of Israel as a youth. He ultimately ascended to the throne and the power of Israel became Israel's greatest king in all of his history. He, he was a singer uh, in that he wrote the Psalms and sang beautifully, played instruments and so much of our lives when we face battles and giants and fears, we turn to the Psalms and the, the songs of David that he gave us in times of, of trouble, in times of struggle, and always reflecting. David spent many hours as a shepherd boy looking up and beyond the stars into the sky and seeing the face of God by faith. He knew God, he loved God, and it was God who said, this is a man after my own heart. It would be one thing if his family said it or his friends said it, but God said, this is a man after my own heart. And it all began on a battleground at the Valley of Elah. So let me remind you of what happened in this story. Uh, Israel was uh, facing an enemy, the Philistines. And 
Actually, a group of farmers from Israel had conquered the Philistines, but the Philistines were coming back with a vengeance. And they gathered in this valley, one on one side, one army on one side of the ravine and another on the other. Israel on one side and the Philistines on the other. And they're both planning their strategy as to how they're going to get after it and fight this battle. Until one day, the Israeli army is looking over the ridge and they see something coming at them, something huge, something big, bigger than they'd ever seen. They didn't know exactly what it was until he got nearer and nearer and he began to speak and thunder out words of profanity and blasphemy and calling out the Israelites and challenging them to a battle. His name was Goliath. One man, nearly 10 feet tall. He's just a few inches from the rim on an NBA or anybody else's court. This is a big man. He, he, he wore armor glistening in the sun. He had a huge sword. The armor may have weighed up to 200 pounds. So you add it all up, this is a four or 500 pound beast. He's a killing machine. He's been a soldier, according to the scripture, since he was a youth. He was a bad, bad man. And he, and he issues a challenge to the Israelites. He say, let's don't have all of you fighting here. Let's just one-on-one -on -one here. I'll fight your champion. You send out the best you have, the best fighter you have, the best soldier you have, and it will be me against you. And whoever wins, wins the battle and takes captive the other's army. So what a dare by this giant. And the Israelites were scared to death. You might've been afraid as well. They're not coming out. And this happens every single day for 40 days. The giant comes out, he threatens them, he taunts them, he trash talks them, he's cursing them, blaspheming the name of God, uttering uh, profanities in the name of his gods, these terrible idolatrous gods of the Philistines. The Philistines were a foul and filthy pe people. And this bad man, the giant, he was the worst of the worst. You could probably smell the guy coming at 100 yards. <laughs> they were afraid. It's happening every single day, day after day after day, 40 days in a row. Let's just stop right there and let me remind you something about the giants. Because you may be facing giants in your own life. A giant of fear, a giant of discouragement, a giant of loneliness, a uh, it's, it's a giant that uh, is taking you down and intimidating you every day, taunting you, threatening you every single day. And uh, it could be an addiction. It, it could be anything in your life that is threatening you and making you feel, what's this, small. The problem with giants is not that they're so big, but that they make us feel so small. And this giant was making everybody in Israel feel very, very small and afraid. And it could happen to you. And if you don't deal with the giants and defeat the giants in your life, they're just gonna keep coming back every single day, day after day. They're gonna be here today, they're gonna be here tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day after that, and forever, until you're willing to fight the giant and defeat the giant the way David ends up defeating this giant. And I'm gonna tell you how in just a moment, but you get the picture. And that's when David, the shepherd boy, comes on the scene. Now, when he shows up, <laughs> he doesn't show up as a soldier. He's actually the delivery boy. David was a very humble young man. He'd been anointed king already. Saul had forfeited the throne by his behavior. And David had been anointed the king. He's not yet risen to the throne. He's still a boy. And yet his dad with his older brothers on the battlefield wants to know what's going on down in the Valley of Elah. So he, ha he sends David to get information and with food for his brothers. So there's bread and cheese and lots of it. So David doesn't show up as a hero. He's just delivering the food. 
He's delivering the groceries. But when he gets there, he hears the taunts and the threats of this giant, defaming and blaspheming the name of God and the, uh, the armies of God. And he says, what's going on here? Why won't someone go out and fight this giant? And they said, have you seen how big that guy is? David said, well, yeah. But do you know how big our God is? They may have said something like, you know, that man, that monster, he's too big to hit. But David said, no, he's too big to miss. And David said, if nobody else will go, I'm going in. And even his own brothers questioned his motives and everyone said, you can't do this. Uh, he'll, he'll destroy you. We'll all be defeated. It's not you. You're not the champion. But David said, I'm going and I'm going in the name of the Lord God. So finally, Saul, the king, said, okay, you're going. You better put on some armor. And they, it's a comical scene. They, they suit him up in Saul's big armor to go against the armored uh, giant. And David, the little shepherd boy, he's just clanking around in this armor. And he says, I can't fight like this. He said, you know, I learned to fight with my slingshot and a few stones. And I've done this before, not with a giant, but as a shepherd boy, I protected the sheep. And they said, well, help yourself. And that's when David enters the battlefield. And that's where I want to pick up in the reading of our scripture. And I'm going to share the scripture with you today from the paraphrase called the message. We've read this story many times, but this gets at this story in a beautiful way, a descriptive way. And so I want you to hear it from the message, 1 Samuel 17. Then he took his staff, that is David, took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook. People always want to ask, why did he get five stones? Did he think he was going to miss that he would need five? I don't know. Maybe that's David's humility showing. Someone else said, well, the giant had, uh, had four brothers. He was going to get every one of them. I don't know. But he took five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. He's still a shepherd's boy. And his sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. That is, he walked out to the battlefield. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. This is something else that makes me laugh. Uh, when this big giant is coming, 500 pounds of man and armor, like a tank, he's got this little guy who's a shield bearer in front of him, a guy with a shield. And he's walking and that guy, you know, he's, he's feeling pretty cocky himself walking with this giant. You know, we're bad. Yeah, we're bad. We're really bad. But there he is with his shield bearer and the Philistine looked at him. This is verse 42. And he saw David and he disdained him. Now that's a word which means that he just despised him. He said, this is ridiculous. You send a boy out here to fight a man. He hated him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. There it is. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? He's insulted. He said, am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, the filthy Philistine gods. He blasphemed by cursing David. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin and your little sword bearer out here and your armor and your big talk. <laughs> That's all added in just for reference. But I come to you, David said, in the name of the Lord of hosts. That is the Lord of the angel armies. David knew his battle was not a physical battle, but like yours and mine, as we face the enemy, the devil himself, it is a spiritual battle. Engaging with spiritual hosts all around us. David knew that the armies of God and God himself was with him. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This is sort of reminding us, isn't it, of like a pre-wrestling event, the WWF, one of their big events where you get the two guys and they're just trash talking one another. 
Well, Dave is doing more than trash talking. He is truth talking here. And he says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. This was the deal. This was the dare for David. There is a God in Israel. He's much greater and more powerful than this giant. He said earlier to his brother, when his brother was questioning whether he should go to the battle or not, even his motives for going, he said, you're just a boy, go back home. David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Every soldier who goes to battle and is fearless in the battle, knows that there is a cause greater than themselves. And in this case, for David, the cause was the kingdom of God. The cause was the glory of God. Remember, this man after God's own heart who loved God more than anything or anyone, this God uh, who was greater than this giant, David believed and trusted in him. He knew it was a spiritual battle. The battle is the Lord's. Verse 47 said that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not by sword and spear, that is with human weapons, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. God will give you into the hands of his people. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, he's getting closer And closer, what did David do? He did not do what the rest of Israel had been doing for 40 days, running and hiding, cowering, shaking in their sandals, refusing to fight. No, the scripture says that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. That's why I'm calling this message today, run to the battle. As long as you keep running away from your battles, as long as you keep hiding from the enemy, as long as you stay where you are, refusing to go for it in the name of God, to take risks, to do what God has called you to do, to fulfill God's plan and purpose for your life, as long as you're cowering, again I say, you're gonna be every day, every single day, hearing the taunts, hearing the threats, staying in the addiction, staying in the sin, staying in the throes of that temptation, that discouragement, that defeat. You will live a life of defeat as until you are willing to confront the giant, whatever that giant may be in your life, and run to the battle. That's what David did. Verse 49, David put his hand in the bag and he took out a stone, just one, and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Uh, On some occasions when I've been to Israel, I've watched uh, young men uh, sling a stone. They still can do it over there. And some are shepherds, some just kind of do it in the streets for fun. But it's amazing. They'll take a slingshot and wrap it around the top of their heads a few times, swing it around and around and let that stone go. And I'm telling you, it looks like a missile. It, it, it sounds like a 22 pistol coming out of that slingshot and they can hit a post, they can hit a bird. It's, it's amazing. Well, David was trained. He was prepared with that slingshot. And I was just thinking about some of the guys in our church, the Dude Perfect guys, Tyler, Tony and his buddies. And uh, they've got a brand new uh, documentary uh, uh, out about how they became dude perfect and doing all these trick shots and amazing feats of all kinds. And, and, and when you watch these guys, you say, how did he do that? How could that happen? Well, when you read this in the Bible, you say, well, how could a, how could a stone take down a 10 foot giant? David hit him right between the eyes. He knew exactly how to take him down. And God guided that stone into the forehead of that giant and the giant went down and he was unconscious before he hit the ground. He fell to his face on the ground, the scripture said. Verse 50, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. 
Then David ran over and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath. Now, this gets bloody right here. Pulled it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They ran away. And the victory was the Lord. Do you hear what we're saying today? Be fearless in the face of your enemies. Anything or anyone that is taunting you, threatening you, Satan himself, know that the power of God, the name of the Lord our God is greater than all. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Have a heart for God. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Live for the cause of his kingdom and live in the victory that he has provided at the cross. What is all this saying to us today? Satan will see to it, in your life as a believer, that some giant will come your way. Some enemy, even Satan himself, will come against you. But you, as a believer and follower of Christ, in the armor of God, the whole armor of God, and in the strength of his name, through the power of prayer, through the victory that we have in the cross, can overcome every enemy that you face. What is the giant you're facing today? What is the spiritual battle, the struggle that finds you in the valley of Elah today? What's the purpose of this, this whole battle? Is to see the greatness of God. The glory of God, not the glory of a man. The power of God, that God would use a little shepherd with a few stones, just one, and a slingshot to win perhaps the greatest battle in the history of the Israeli army. And I'm just thinking in your life today that it's about time that you stop telling God how big your giant is and you start telling your giant how big your God is and how great your cause is. That we stand up to the enemies of Christ in this culture. That we stand for truth and righteousness. That we stand for the sanctity of life against the enemies that would destroy life. That we stand for the sacredness of the home and of the family. That we give our lives for religious freedom, whatever the cost. People have paid a, a, a valiant price that we would live in freedom and practice our faith. And we need to always fight the battles that we need to fight in every generation. But we will never grow until we grow to face our giants. Why does God allow these giants, like all adversity, to grow us up? David was just a boy, but he became a man that day. He became a champion on that day because God gave him the giant and David became a man in full. So God may send some giants. You can even thank God for the giants if they grow you up. You can thank God for the battles when they build you up. But I promise you, you're never going to grow up in your faith and get strong and mighty against the enemy as long as you keep running and hiding in fear. You got to come out and face your giant. You can't change what you don't first confront. So confront your giant and begin to change the world. As long as we keep running from the battle, we'll keep facing the giants every single day. It's when you stand up that you overcome and become an overcomer, that you discover that God fights for you and God fights with you because the battle is the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have fears. I think David, as courageous a young man as he was, he had to have normal human fears going against the giant. But this was more than bravado coming from David. This was believing in God. And he overcame his fears. 
One of the best definitions I've heard of courage is this, a brave way to be scared. Courage is a brave way to be scared. Sure, there are things in life that scare us, that frighten us, but what we need is a bold faith that overcomes our fears, knowing that our God will come through in his own time and his own way every single time. You can trust the Lord. One thing that we have learned during these days of separation and isolation, fighting this germ, this virus, is that our God is enough, that he can sustain us and he can strengthen us, and that it is perfect love that casts out fear. When we know that we are perfectly loved by God, his everlasting love for us, we can know for sure, for certain, that we're gonna get through this, not barely through, I'm saying not just survival, but revival in our lives. Are you facing some giants today? Fears, failures? Is that giant tempting you, taunting you, telling you you can't constantly? The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? The scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And whatever giant you're facing in your life, whatever problem, obstacle, big thing that stands in front of you, the problem with big things, they, they, they tend to occupy our minds. They're so big in our brains. The battle is often, you know, is fought between our ears. The, the, the battleground is your mind. That's where you win or lose. And you can either be a pessimist, always thinking you're gonna lose, always thinking you're never enough, always thinking that the giant is bigger and better and stronger than you, or you can live in the power of God, in the greatness of your God, the greatness of your cause. You can be an optimist, a Christian optimist, fueled by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my message to you today. Run quickly to the battle, just like David. Don't run and hide anymore, but begin to live in the victory that is ours in Christ. And you know what that means? First and foremost, it means to become a follower of the Lord Jesus. You know, in one way, this story is an illustration of what happened at the cross. Because years later, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, in David's lineage and family, Jesus, the son of God, the son of David, went one-on-one -on -one against the devil himself at the cross. Just like it was one-on-one, -on -one, winner take all in the Valley of Elah, it was winner take all on the Mount of Calvary when Christ went to the cross. And at the cross, Jesus did battle face to face with Satan himself, with sin and judgment and hell. And Jesus conquered death that day. And he cut off the head of Satan when he died and rose again. And because of this victory, a vicarious victory for us, that word means he took our place on the cross. He fought the battle for us and he won, he won, he won. And because Jesus finished the fight that day, the battle is over. The victory is won. And if you will trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, believing and receiving him today, you will live, begin to live in this victory and grow strong in your faith and face every battle, not with fear, but with fearlessness. You can't live in fear and faith at the same time. One will defeat the other. I'm calling you to live in faith, not faith in faith, but faith in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So right now, where you are, I'm going to invite you to receive Jesus, your champion, the champion of all champions, the greater son of David, the savior, the Messiah, the King, Jesus, to come into your life. Just ask him. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Do like David. I come to you in the name of of my God, come in the name of the Lord Jesus today and say, Lord, I turn from my sin. That's repenting of sin. That means you turn your back on your sin and you turn your life to the cross. You ask him to forgive you, 
to come into your life and he will do it. He promised he would. And he's standing at the door of your life right now knocking. Many of you are watching on a tablet, maybe in your home or on a screen uh, where you live. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Jesus is not going to tear the door down, burst into your life, but he waits for you to welcome him in. Will you invite Christ into your life right now? Will you trust him as your Lord and Savior? Say, Jesus, I do trust you. Lord, I ask you to save me. Save me from my sins. Save me from death. Save me from judgment. I trust you as my Lord, my Savior, my life, my all. Others of you, you've been living in defeat. You're a believer. But you've not been living in the joy and the victory that is ours in Christ. And you may at this moment want to pray a prayer of renewal and rededication of your life. I believe God is renewing his church. I believe God is changing the lives of Christians right now in the midst of this pandemic. And many of you right now, right where you are, want to simply say, Lord, I've been going in the wrong direction. I've been running away from you. Now I want to run to you in the victory that is mine. Lord, I renew and rededicate my life to you. I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and my failures. And Lord, fill me with your spirit that I might live in your victory. For those of you who are praying today, either to receive Christ or to rededicate your life, if you will text the number on your screen, 74788, and text in Jesus. We have a new believer's Bible that we will send to you along with my book, which is Essentials for the Christian Life, New Life in Christ. We'll send you both books if you will let us know of your decision for Christ. Uh, you know, David had to take that first step, didn't he? I mean, to run to the battle, there's the first step. I'm asking you to take this step. And if you see on your screen a hand raise, that's your opportunity to click on the, on the hand on the screen. Clicking on will be saying, I'm raising a hand and I'm trusting in Christ. I'm renewing my faith. I'm, re I'm making a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ today. So raise a hand or as I said, others just text in Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, the name that is above every name. Text it in to 74788. And may God bless you as you begin to follow Christ and live in the victory that is ours in Him. Thank you for joining us this day. It won't be long until we are back gathered in our churches here at Prestonwood. We're going to be gathering again gradually, slowly but surely. We're going to be getting back together beginning on the weekend of May the 30th and the 31st. We can't wait to see the faces of our our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and all who can come on that day. If you would like to register to be a part of that service, and it does require a registration in order that we can you know, contain the crowd and practice safe distancing and all the rest, uh, then go to Prestonwood.org, and there's a place there where all the instructions are, are given so that you can be a part of that service on Saturday night, the 30th, or on Sunday morning, both campuses, Plano, North Campus, along with Espanol. It's gonna be an incredibly wonderful day as we begin getting back together. But we're always gonna be online. We've learned some wonderful things about preaching, worshiping, sharing the love of Christ online. And we've had thousands upon thousands of people join us. And we know that you're going to be there. Many of you are going to be there in the days ahead. God bless you. And may Jesus Christ be praised.